Hi there, and welcome to another uh, video in the History Hound Presents series. My name is Richard McLeod, and today we're going to take a look at Fairy Lake, and the history behind Fairy Lake, the importance of Fairy Lake to our history, take a look at how it's developed uh, over the years, and maybe even attempt to answer that question that I'm asked all the time. How did it become Fairy Lake? Who named it Fairy Lake? And no, it wasn't because uh, somebody saw miniature people running around with wings. Uh, not quite as exciting as that. So on the title slide of this presentation, uh, you'll notice that I have uh, put up a map of uh, early Newmarket. And you'll notice that uh, the Mill Pond, which was to become Fairy Lake, I guess, uh, later in our history, but the Mill Pond uh, everything's clustered around the mill pond. Uh, one could argue that uh, Newmarket's very existence started uh, clustered around uh, the mill pond. Now, the mill pond is not a natural pond. The mill pond was actually the product of the damming of the river uh, by our ancestors. And so as long as we understand that from the beginning, uh, you know, we'll understand why it was uh, so important that they created this mill pond in order for uh, early industry to survive. Uh, it was the lifeblood of the, of the village back then. So uh, my goal uh, today is that we take a, uh, a take a look at the history of the area around the pond that we now call uh, Fairy Lake. Uh, that we examine the importance of Fairy Lake and the Holland watershed, the whole Holland watershed played uh, in our history and growth. We take a look at how the uh, water management infrastructure has grown around Fairy Lake and area. Uh, we'll take a little bit uh, of a look back at uh, floods, and we've had a few of those, um, which have uh, necessitated uh, our rethinking how uh, Fairy Lake will be, uh, be built. Uh, all of the improvements that we had to make in Fairy Lake were essentially because of the fact that uh, we had massive flooding surrounding Fairy Lake uh, over a number of years. I guess the, the last really big one we had was in 1954 with Hurricane Hazel. And then finally, we'll look at the Fairy Lake Conservation Area today and uh, how it has returned to being a focal point of the town, a uh, beautiful park, uh, events are scheduled there. I would argue that uh, uh, the River Common is an extension of the Fairy Lake uh, area. Uh, and this is where people go for uh, the events that we run today. So it still plays a huge part in, uh, in our enjoyment and it's still the focal point of the town. As always, I like to show a few uh, maps in the beginning so that you can get a better idea of the area that we're talking about. So this is a very early uh, map of Newmarket uh, from 1801. As you can see, uh, the mill pond is, uh, is featured there. Uh, you can see that uh, as we began our history, uh, the, uh, the mill pond had been created uh, in order to, to run uh, the turbines for the grist mill of, uh, of Mr. Hill, Joseph Hill, uh, who built the first mill. Uh, really, uh, I guess you'd say where the old hydro building was. Now, I uh, believe it's Cache Restaurants that's there. And we're gonna see some, some pictures uh, through history of how that area is developed. But uh, he was really the first uh, uh, person to, to build a mill there uh, as time went on. And if you take a look at our history, you'll see that uh, we had about eight mills uh, along the stretch of uh, a Ferry Lake and the, uh, the Holland River uh, stretching up to around where Davis Drive was. Uh, it was a major source of, of water. Uh, people today, you know, they look over the, the bridge uh, on Water Street and they see you know, a tiny little stream uh, uh, running along there. And they don't realize that uh, the Holland River at one time uh, used to be the whole length 
or whole width, I should say, uh, between what they call the specialty flats or where the office specialty was and where the stores are on Main Street. That was a, it was a major, major river. Uh, and of course, because of that, uh, flooding and, uh, and that sort of thing was, uh, was a real hazard for Newmarket. So that's in 1801. We move ahead here. This is a, another picture uh, showing you how uh, Newmarket is actually spreading out uh, to the north from the mill pond uh, with all of the streets uh, uh, proceeding along uh, both Main Street and what is now Prospect Street. The, uh, you'll notice uh, that uh, at the very beginning, the only street that existed was, was Water Street uh, crossing the river. Uh, there were no other crossings of the river at that point. There were no bridges, no Queen Street Bridge, no Timothy Street Bridge. In fact, Timothy Street uh, didn't come around or didn't wasn't built, wasn't built through and a bridge put in until uh, 1865. So, you know, quite a while after the founding of Newmark. This is uh, a picture of, or a map of uh, Newmark in, eight, in the 1870s. And again, you'll see uh, things are still pretty much clustered around Mill Pond uh, and the, uh, the river. The river was what brought uh, livelihood to people. The mills were and breweries were a big business uh, here in Newmarket. Uh, in the coming uh, weeks, uh, I'm going to be coming out with more articles on Newmarket today uh, on early commerce in Newmarket. And at that point, you're, you'll get an opportunity to hear more about the, the early businesses of Newmarket and how they were dependent upon a, a water supply and a, a, a rapidly moving current, uh, which would turn generators and in turn would allow them to generate both electricity and to run a, a grist mill or a wood mill or whatever. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And again, uh, we forward to the 1890s. And again, you'll notice the market has uh, enlarged considerably the downtown area. But again, the focal point is still uh, the area around Ferry Lake. So the point uh, to take out of uh, the first part of uh, this presentation is that Ferry Lake, uh, contrary to what some people may tell you, uh, was the very beginning of Newmarket. Yes, uh, you know, Tempe Rogers brought uh, settlers uh, to Young Street and uh, they were all, of course, farmers. But just think about it. They were farming. They had to take their grain someplace uh, for it to be turned into flour and to uh, to be processed. And, and that that place that they brought it was to downtown Newmarket, uh, where the the mills were were located. Also, it's important to remember that uh, at that point, Young Street was not part of Newmarket. Newmarket was essentially uh, the area around Ferry Lake. Um, if you take a look at the deeds for the properties on Young Street, they don't say Newmarket they say King Township or the Township of King. So that's an interesting fact. So as I said, one can argue that the damming of the east tributary of the Holland River uh, to create the mill pond was the principal reason for the establishment of Newmarket. We know a little bit about the, uh, the early settlers and they all refer to the fact that the, uh, the fact that there was a fast moving river that this river had the capacity to, to turn generators and, and therefore uh, allow them to establish their mills was an important reason why they came to the area and uh, why they, they decided to set up business uh, in the downtown area. The mill pond was traditionally uh, referred to as simply the pond for the first uh, 95 years or more of our history. Uh, wasn't called Ferry Lake. Uh, my grandfather, who, uh, who came here in the 1880s, uh, when I was a little boy, I can remember him uh, always calling it the Mill Pond. He never called it Ferry Lake. Uh, I asked him once why, you know, its name is uh, Ferry Lake. And he said, no, it isn't. He said, this is what some people call it, but it's the Mill Pond. Uh, it's always been the Mill Pond. Uh, so, you know, uh, the name Ferry Lake is a, a fairly recent, I guess you'd say, uh, phenomenon. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how that came to, to be. Around 1900, uh, commercial photographers, and this is uh, something that was happening all over 
uh, Canada and the United States, commercial photographers, particularly British photographers, uh, were coming to the to the new market area and uh, looking for great pictures that they could take in order to uh, to create postcards of the new world. And uh, I guess the the picturesque uh, subject of the uh, of the mill pond uh, because it was undeveloped, quite wild uh, at that point, uh, made them decide that it was an excellent uh, place to take pictures and to create uh, uh, postcards for the for sale, both in Britain and, of course, here in Canada locally. These commercial uh, photographers, according to, to what we've been able to ascertain, uh, decided that they would uh, move away from Mill Pond. I guess it wasn't a sexy name uh, or sexy enough, I guess, to sell uh, postcards. And so they decided to call it Fairy Lake. Uh, the uh, only explanation we have of that was one uh, gentleman who left a note that uh, it was, uh, the, the lake and the surrounding around the lake was, was fairy-like. Uh, and I guess hence he decided to call it Fairy Lake. I know that uh, in some of the uh, the old postcards uh, that appeared uh, during this period of time, uh, you'll notice that uh, they didn't call it Fairy Lake, they said the Fairy Lake Lake. Uh, and of course, uh, that name was picked up in local jargon by a number of people. But again, as I, I, I said, uh, on most maps that you find uh, uh, of the first century and uh, probably the, the first uh, 120 years, uh, it's called the Mill Pond, it's not called Fairy Lake. In 1903, when the post office gave its approval for postcards to be distributed uh, through the post, the photo of Fairy Lake was a, a, a huge seller. Uh, you know, we know that because uh, even today, uh, if you go to a show or if you're buying postcards of Canada, you'll find that pictures uh, of uh, Fairy Lake uh, are one of the more expensive uh, postcards uh, that you can uh, that you can get. Uh, some of them are, are quite spectacular. They were, of course, colored uh, later on, and it really does look uh, like a fairyland uh, uh, with its its colors and its uh, beautiful water background. It really does look nice. Also, too, uh, it's probably a good idea to remember that uh, the name was not always fairy, uh, but as you can see, had uh, a couple of other uh, different spellings. Uh, some postcards uh, called it fairy with an EY at the end, and some called it fairy as in, you know, a ferry going across a river. The name Fairy Lake became recognized through general use, but the name was never officially adopted or registered until uh, much later in our history. Uh, and it really until uh, we had the, uh, the first major uh, flood, uh, you can find virtually no reference to the, uh, uh, to the area in the local media as being Fairy Lake, but it was referred to as the Mill Pond. Uh, the whole area, uh, as I say, was rapidly settled uh, after the Amer American Revolution. Uh, we really had two centers of, of, uh, of settlement uh, here in Newmarket. We, of course, had the downtown area around Ferry Lake, and we had the area along Young Street. Uh, the area around Long Street, Young Street was uh, where my, uh, my relatives uh, settled, um, and they came with uh, Timothy Rogers uh, around 1801-1802, uh, and uh, they were primarily agrarian. Of course, they were they had farms and uh, they were bringing their produce into uh, a new market uh, to be processed. In 1800, Timothy Rogers, as I said, uh, uh, brought the, the Quakers here to Newmarket. One of the primary needs uh, for these early settlers, because they were growing grains, was to have a place to, to grind their wheat into flour and uh, a place to uh, bring their lumber to be to be all cut up so that they could uh, build their, their properties, build their houses, uh, build their fences, whatever. There's, as I say, that one of the things that drew uh, people to here was the potential uh, to be able to build mills along the, the river. 
uh, and to harness the, the, the power of the river uh, in order to, to run mills. I know today it's hard uh, for most people when I do my walking tours, people, you know, start laughing immediately when I start talking about the, the mighty uh, river. Uh, but uh, it was, in fact, a, a quite an impressive river uh, back then before it was dammed. And even after it was dammed, uh, it was a, a pretty big river. Uh, those, those, uh, all those people who can remember 1954 and the... Uh, Hurricane Hazel will remember that the, the banks flooded and uh, a great deal of downtown Newmarket was, was underwater. Um, so it was still a potential, uh, potentially great river. Also, uh, for those who are aware of the, the uh, uh, conservation uh, people's uh, edict for that area, uh, it's under heavy restrictions for, uh, for flood it's a floodplain, and uh, so uh, all building that's that's done along that area had to conform to uh, to strict regulations, so that uh, if there ever was another flood and uh, and uh, this area flooded, uh, that we wouldn't have a, a massive uh, loss of property. Of interest. Uh, uh, is that the, the first bush, bushel of wheat uh, was actually uh, ground here in Newmarket. We know this from receipts uh, just before Christmas in 1801. And it was by Joseph Hill and James Kinsley, who had constructed a dam to, uh, to run a grist mill, which they had built. Uh, Joseph Hill also built a store and a wooden residence uh, just to the west of the mill. Uh, just to spend a few seconds talking about that, uh, that uh, uh, building was uh, was located where, as I say, the Cache restaurant is now. Uh, for a long time, for people who grew up, I guess, in in, uh, in Newmarket, you remember that the hydro office was there for a long, long time. There was a reason why the hydro office was there for a long, long time. It uh, uh, was able to generate electricity uh, uh, from the uh, from the water that was. Uh, that was reaching the falls. And also, if you're out for a walk, if we ever get to, to walk around uh, Ferry Lake in groups, you can go and take a look at the building at the, at the rear of Cache, Cache Restaurant, uh, where you'll still see uh, remnants of the old generating uh, machining that is there. Uh, again, that is where Mr. Hill's house was, uh, right beside the, uh, the mill, which he also built right there. Uh, so, you know, hopefully you're starting to get a little bit of a picture for uh, what the area was around, was like around Ferry Lake at that time. Eventually, the house of Joseph Hill was moved uh, precisely in 1855, uh, and it was moved up to, to Eagles, Eagle Street and William Street. Uh, better known uh, if you come to the end of Church Street and uh, where it meets the... Uh, uh, Eagle Street, uh, you'll see the, the old house uh, which was moved there. That is, most people agree, is the oldest house in Newmarket. It was Joseph Hill's house that he built there back in, uh, in the early 1800s. Uh, it's changed a lot, of course. It's been turned the other way. It's had a few additions uh, put in. Uh, it has uh, become, I guess, a little bit of a rooming house. Uh, there's a number of families that live in there, but it is, in fact, the oldest uh, a house uh, in Newmarket that's still around. The mill and the wooden bridge over the stream were destroyed by a fire in 1871 uh, and consequently they were uh, rebuilt. There was another bridge uh, built or another mill I should say built in 1858 uh, between Timothy Street and Water Street. Uh, that's where the seniors building now stands uh, east of the uh, of the railway tracks. Uh, so as if we take a look at our history, you'll see that uh, mills started to go up along the, the, the river uh, because the river was then controlled uh, somewhat by the, uh, uh, the, 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 the damming of the, the 
the river, uh, which had created uh, the mill pond in the first place. Uh, so they were able to control the river and, uh, and they were able to harness the river. In 1858, the population of Newmarket had grown to about 2,100, which is a considerable size. Uh, and uh, one of the issues, of course, at that time, and of course, I, I, a little plug for an article I wrote uh, for Newmarket today, uh, which was on natural disasters. Uh, that have hit Newmarket. You know, we talked about the floods, we talked about the fires, uh, but Newmarket was exclusively or almost exclusively built of wood. And so obviously uh, fire was a major problem. Uh, the joke always used to be that Newmarket's idea of rezoning was uh, fire and flood. Uh, most of our uh, growth and regrowth uh, over the existing uh, bones of uh, our buildings was uh, because we had had a major fire or we had had a, a major flood uh, in that downtown area that uh, abutted the uh, Ferry Lake area. And of course, the uh, over time, the role of the pond was to change and it was to, as well as being part of the working life of Newmarket, uh, it started to be cultivated uh, to be a area where the public could go and uh, for recreational reasons. Uh, many of you may, uh, if, if you uh, if you were born, uh, say, uh, before uh, the 1960s, you probably will remember when Ferry Lake used to freeze and people would go down there and either play hockey, play a little shinny, or would, uh, would skate on, on uh, Ferry Lake. Uh, that drew a lot of people. There were, you know, there were little pavilions where people could go in and, and get warm and, uh, and put their skates on and whatever. Uh, so you know, it was quite interesting. And of course, uh, before we had electricity and we had the ability to have indoor refrigerators, uh, this is where we used to get our ice blocks. Uh, my grandmother was uh, used to always tell me about the fact that uh, they had a big wooden ice box. Uh, in their home and or in their back kitchen and uh, they would go and buy uh, blocks of ice that were cut from Ferry Lake and uh, and put it in there and this is how they would store uh, all of those foodstuffs that uh, needed to be refrigerated uh, in order to uh, to maintain their shelf life. Gradually the use of, of water power uh, was replaced by steam power and the function of the pond was to take on a different role. It was a source of, uh, of water for our, main, uh, our water mains and our hydrants. And again, uh, another uh, sort of uh, push for one of my articles. I wrote an article on the, the water system uh, that was put in. Uh, our mayor, uh, Mayor Kane, uh, the son of uh, our first mayor, uh, put in all kinds of conveniences to Newmarket. Uh, one, one would, uh, I think, could argue that uh, he changed Newmarket more than any other mayor we've ever had. Uh, he put in uh, electricity, he brought the telephone here, but one of the things that he did was he, uh, he put in a water system in the downtown area, which was fed by artesian wells um, and by Ferry Lake. Uh, nowadays, people always joke, uh, they don't think they would like to get their water from Ferry Lake, but uh, as I say, uh, if you want to know more about uh, uh, that time and, and the use of, uh, of water from Ferry Lake for our uh, home use, uh, you could read the article on New Market Today. I, I think it's uh, fairly interesting. The uh, Eventually, as I say, uh, the mill uh, on Ferry Lake converted from water power to, to steam power, but again, uh, the, uh, the water from Ferry Lake was essential for this operation. The river was, of course, fed by artesian wells. This is another thing that, that I think a lot of people don't realize. Newmarket is, uh, has got a, a huge amount of underground water. Uh, this is one of the reasons, and uh, for those people who have uh, attended one of my presentations on the canal, you'll know that the 
the whole notion that there was no water uh, to fill the canal, and this is one of the reasons why it was a, a foolish endeavor, were just simply wrong. Uh, Newmarket uh, uh, is full of, uh, of underground water. I remember uh, during my uh, years of, uh, of working at the uh, uh, cemetery, uh, both the Protestant and the Catholic cemetery, uh, when I was going to university, uh, I always tell the story about when we used to dig a grave. Uh, it was anywhere from 10 minutes to half an hour, and that grave would, would fill up with water. So uh, those people who remember their science classes, uh, you will remember that they always told you that water doesn't climb uh, hill, doesn't go uphill, and yet uh, the miracle was that if you dug a hole, and I understand it's still uh, true today, if you dig a hole, uh, up in that area, it will very quickly fill with water. Well, this was also true for the area around Ferry Lake because this is essentially why the river was there. The river was, in fact, bubbling up uh, from underground. And this is the area where they built artesian wells uh, between 150 and 500 feet deep. Uh, for those people who ask, those, those wells uh, are still there uh, and uh, are still servicing Newmarket, a uh, certain part of Newmarket. Uh, so I think that's kind of interesting as well. In 1915, there were 14 wells that surrounded the pond. The pumping station became known as the Waterworks. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Hill's uh, mill uh, eventually uh, was converted into uh, what they call the Waterworks. And the waterworks was the pumping station for uh, Newmarket. This is where uh, all the water was pumped through the hoses or the underground uh, uh, hoses uh, to service uh, the downtown area of Newmarket. Uh, some of you even may remember uh, when the uh, water uh, waterworks was there. And a little later in this presentation, I'll show you some pictures of the waterworks. And Maybe that'll remind you of having either seen pictures of it or seen it in, in person. The dam that they built uh, right from the beginning was a problem for them. Initially, of course, it was built of wood and uh, the amount of water uh, that was passing through the dam was constantly causing them to have to, to re-repair uh, the dam. If we had any type of any flood, um, the dam would give way and uh, of course the downtown area would, would flood. So they were constantly uh, doing repairs. They tried different designs to see if they could, uh, if that would help, but essentially it didn't. Uh, you know, either the water would find its, some way to wash away the wood or the water would find some way over the dam uh, in an uncontrolled manner. Back in the beginning, uh, what there was was large uh, square timbers laid horizontally and then uh, backed up by vertical uh, timber pilings. In other words, what they were basically doing is, is building almost like a wall of a fort, an early uh, fort, um, with the idea that this would uh, somehow control the water. And uh, history has shown us that it didn't. Uh, you know, they frequently they would give way, and of course, when they gave way, a uh, huge uh, torrent of water would would uh, be released, and uh, this would do massive damage not only to the downtown area, uh, but to the businesses along the uh, the river uh, because of the uncontrolled rush of water. Eventually, they got the idea that what they would do is they would add a earthen embankment to the to the uh, to the dam. So in other words, uh, what they would do is they would put in, uh, re, reinstall the wood, and then they would build up the area with, uh, with earth, uh, thinking that this would uh, help to control the water. And of course, that didn't work because, of course, what, does, what happens when you have uh, rapidly moving water uh, going by soil? It erodes it. And of course, uh, it didn't uh, last very long before they had to, to repair it. Uh, there were walkways uh, with handrails that, uh, that extended over the dam, and they provided uh, the means for uh, uh, the uh, dam to be repaired. Well, first of all, to be built and then to, to be repaired. And uh, 
as I say, you know, we New Market was known for frequent floods uh, in that area, and it was essentially because the dam that they they had put in was not sufficient to handle the volume of water. We have uh, pictures and we have uh, uh, written accounts of the replacement of the dam in 1902. Uh, and uh, at that point, they decided that they would drain the, the pond and uh, they took out all the old tree stumps and, uh, and the vegetation that had been there for a hundred years uh, from the original uh, uh, building of the uh, of the damming of the of the river and the the uh, construction of the pond, um, I love uh, to be a metal uh, metal detector uh, historian. Uh, so I would love to have been around back then to have been able to to go through the area and, and look for artifacts before they uh, allowed the water back in. But uh, you know, I, I think it would have been very very interesting because that. That pond had essentially been there for for a hundred years, uh, and uh, it was just virgin land. They had just simply dammed the river and allowed the pond to to be uh, uh, to be created. The process, this process, as I said, was constantly being repeated and repeated. And in 1927, a decision was uh, reached to re to replace it with a more permanent dam built of concrete. So. By 1927, uh, we had the first uh, appearance of that uh, of concrete, and they decided that what they would do is they would put in a new concrete uh, dam. In September of 1927, uh, uh, they decided that they would build a new dam, and this new dam was going to cost six thousand dollars. And again, it's it's you know when you talk to people, people always say, well, six thousand dollars is fairly inexpensive to build a dam. Well, $6,000 was an amazing amount of money back then. That was a major project. Uh, so you can tell how important it was and how the importance that uh, the uh, uh, town fathers uh, uh, put into having an effective dam. The old 12 by 12 uh, uh, timbers were removed and a new dam and a side abutment was uh, put in to reinforce the concrete. And uh, on the December 9th of that year, uh, they opened it up uh, and the water began to flow. That structure stood, uh, even though uh, it was uh, damaged by, uh, by subsequent flights, floods in uh, uh, 1929 and also in 1954, uh, that same dam uh, stood. They, were, they had to repair it for those people who remember either the flood or have seen pictures of the flood, you'll remember that uh, essentially the water uh, during the floods was so bad that it, it literally lifted the, the, uh, uh, the whole bridge up and, uh, and carried it along the river. Uh, I know that uh, uh, my family talked about uh, how you could go down to Timothy Street and all, also as far down as, uh, as Queen Street and see uh, parts of the uh, of the dam uh, flowing down the river, so you could tell how much damage was done. So, I mean, basically, uh, you know, this was a, a major problem for for Newmarket. The side of, uh, uh, abutments were always washing out. Water always finds some way to to get around a barrier. Uh, it's one of the wonders of nature, and uh, this is exactly what happened. Uh, you know. Uh, particularly uh, during floods, but even during, uh, you know, spring flaw. Uh, we were always, you know, our relatives and ancestors were always finding that uh, the water would find some way around the dam and, uh, and would flood uh, the area on the other side of the street. The foundation of the iron bridge that uh, uh, was there uh, on Water Street uh, before the 1954 uh, flood, Hurricane Hazel. To show you how uh, much volume of water there was, that was actually lifted up and carried along uh, with the flood uh, when the flood waters uh, breached the, the dam. 
again in 1962, and this is something that a lot of you will remember, uh, the bridge was replaced uh, with a new concrete one. This time it was entirely concrete as opposed to just having concrete uh, parts to it. Uh, and uh, the existing bridge was dedicated to a gentleman named Fred Lundy, uh, who had been a town council member, and uh, he was a, a distant relative of mine. So yay for the Lundys. Again, I, I refer to, uh, to October 15th of uh, 1954 uh, with Hurricane Hazel. This time, as I said, the earthen retaining wall uh, on the east side was washed away and uh, the entire uh, uh, road was in fact uh, disappeared uh, from view uh, because the water was able to bypass the dam and go around uh, the dam and escape. The main part of the dam remained, but the apron on the north side was completely destroyed and there were uh, gaps in the, the, the dam uh, to a depth of about four feet, uh, just uh, from the sheer volume of the water that was passing uh, or trying to pass underneath the dam. On the east side, there were uh, uh, holes in the abutment of 12 feet deep and extended under the wall to three and a half feet deep. So that just to shows you the power of the water uh, that this dam was, was holding back. In the spring, um, you know, if, even today, if you happen to take a walk either through Ferry Lake or you just take a, a walk down to Water Street and watch the water coming over the dam, uh, you can see that there's a great deal of volume that is, uh, that is coming along there. And this is after subsequent dams were built, uh, you know, to the south, um, you know, in Aurora and, uh, and further along. The uh, Upper Holland Valley Conserv uh, Conservation Authority stepped in and was created after the, uh, the, uh, the floods uh, of 54. And uh, they decided that what they would do is they would uh, take control of the area and they would uh, hopefully come up with a solution to our constant flooding problems. And, uh, and they've been able to do that. I mean, uh, you know, we've had a few minor uh, uh, floods uh, since 1954, but nothing uh, as catastrophic as the, the flood of 1954. And they took the opportunity at that point to, to uh, I guess you'd say, uh, plant plants and, uh, and create a park at Ferry Lake uh, under their authority. And again, uh, in the 1970s, the, the uh, uh, bridge was reinforced yet again. Now, I, I mentioned that the, the area around Ferry Lake has seen a lot of changes, uh, you know, since 1801. Most of those changes, uh, rapid changes, uh, took place uh, up to the 1950s. At the south and east side, in the early 1800s, there were sawmills and a cooper shop. Uh, as well, there were actually people who had cottages there, and we'll see pictures in a few minutes of, uh, of a couple of places where people had built cabins uh, along the, the, the uh, mill pond, uh, I guess for fishing and uh, for recreation, so that was kind of cool. In 1853, uh, they put in a, uh, a uh, I guess you'd say a street. Uh, which allowed them to access and, and go around the pond. Uh, that was called uh, Cotter Street, and it eventually, uh, that part of it was uh, renamed Prospect Street. On the west side of the dam, a gentleman named Donald Sutherland, uh, our first reeve, purchased the mill and store that was built by Joseph uh, Hill, and the area extending to the south uh, down to uh, Dutchman's Pond, which is another interesting story because uh, what they decided to do, and I think if you walk around fairly even today, you can see this, there is a, a little indented, indented uh, pond uh, uh, that is part of Ferry Lake. Uh, that was called uh, Dutchman's uh, Pond uh, back then. Uh, this property included a fine brick residence that was built by Colonel Cotter. The lawn extended to the edge of the water and the little bay that had been created. And there was a small island uh, with a bridge 
and that bridge uh, led over to a gazebo, uh, which covered the island. The cool thing is that, uh, you know, probably about five or six years ago, they discovered that uh, uh, they still had, or they're still storing this gazebo that had been uh, been there uh, way back then. And uh, we've been trying, we meaning the people who are interested in heritage and Newmarket, have been trying to get them to to restore this gazebo back to, to its original uh, state. Uh, I think it'd be cool to, to take it and put it on the, uh, the conservation uh, area that they plan to put in at the Mulock estate. Uh, you know, it's historic. It's quite an incredible uh, gazebo. It's huge. Uh, it would uh, probably allow a large number of people to, to sit under uh, under it, and out of the sun, and you could probably even have concerts there. So I think that would be cool if they were able to bring that back. But it still exists. It's uh, being stored at the Works Department. Uh, in September of 1901, and again, you probably, if you read my articles on a regular basis, you probably know this. Uh, in front of the waterworks, they 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 put a monument to uh, to Private Wesley. Uh, Haynes. He was a member of the first Canadian contingent and he had uh, gone to fight in the Boer War, one of uh, six or seven other uh, local lads that went. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't come back. He died over there and a monument was, was placed there. Uh, that mon monument was moved uh, to uh, the memorial park that they created across from St. Paul's uh, Church on Darcy Street uh, where it uh, meets, meets uh, church across the road uh, for those people who are aware of that area of uh, the uh, Peter Gorman Pool. In 1899, uh, the railroad uh, built uh, uh, an electric railroad from Toronto to Jackson's Point and Sutton, and it used the Newmarket Hydro Generation Plant beside the pond to power its rails. So basically, uh, because it was an all-electric railroad, uh, the uh, hydro that was generated at uh, Ferry Lake at the Newmarket Hydro Generation Plant uh, was used to, to, uh, for, for electricity to power the, the railroad uh, as it passed, as it approached and passed through Newmarket, uh, which I think was kind of cool. Uh, and it's important to understand, and I mentioned this uh, in, in my article that I wrote on the Metropolitan Electric uh, railroad. It's important to understand that uh, one of the major benefits of the building that railroad through Newmarket, uh, even though it didn't last, you know, awfully long, was that uh, along with the electricity generated uh, here uh, in Newmarket for the railroad, uh, also uh, Mayor Kane was able to take that that or tap into that hydro and was able to to offer hydro to the houses in the downtown area. So to power not only their homes, but of course, any industry that was, there was in the downtown area. And this is primarily where most of the industry was anyway. So it was a real boon for the town. So, you know, we owe a lot of uh, uh, respect to, to the people who built the Metropolitan Railroad because in fact, uh, you know, I tell people in my presentations that they were uh, extremely important in the, uh, the bringing of high road to Newmarket. Uh, the railroad continued to provide power to the town until 1930. In 1930, of course, the, the railroad uh, stopped running through uh, Newmarket. In fact, it, uh, in 1930, it, it only uh, ran to Richmond Hill. It eventually stopped running to Richmond Hill, but it only ran to, to uh, Richmond Hill uh, after 1930. And when they left uh, and they stopped coming up here, uh, they sold the power generation capability to Ontario Hydro uh, generation uh, that continued it on. So hence, uh, this is the reason why uh, many of you will probably remember uh, from your childhood that we had the hydro uh, office that was located beso beside uh, Ferry Lake. In 1945, Ontario Hydro assumed complete control of all power that was being generated here in Newmarket. And again, uh, in 1949, uh, we changed from uh, a 25 cycle to 60 cycle. Uh, 
because it was part of a, a, a overall change that was taking place right across uh, uh, the province. The waterworks complex was, was closed in 1959 and a new hydro office was erected on the site December of uh, 1960. And again, as I alluded to earlier, uh, well, they put in the new building, uh, you know, great for us. They, they didn't take out the old uh, power generation equipment that was there. It's still, as I say, sitting in an old shack uh, behind Cassé uh, restaurant. Uh, I noticed the last time I was walking by there uh, that they some of the windows have been uh, filled in, but there are a couple of windows that you can peek into uh, and, uh, and see the equipment there. A little dark in there, but you can, you can see the, the equipment. In addition to its practical use for power generation, the pond was a popular uh, recreation area starting in the, in the 50s. And of course, it still serves that purpose today. During the summer of 1863, the Newmarket Regatta, believe it or not, was organized with races back and forth between uh, across the pond every Saturday afternoon, and there were prizes. And again, I've got a picture of, uh, of one of those boats uh, uh, involved in, in the regatta. So think about your walks along Ferry Lake now and imagine that at one time uh, you used to, they used to have uh, um, races on, on, on the pond. Uh, and of course, people used to swim in the pond. Now, I'm not too sure whether it's safe to, to swim in the pond. Uh, lots of ducks and I don't know how clean the water is, but Again, that's another thing. Over the years, uh, you know, Fairy Lake has been drained and, and cleaned. And uh, the last time they, they did it, uh, they uh, put in a great deal of cement uh, to try and uh, keep the, all the mud and, uh, and weeds from growing back. So, you know, they have been trying to beautify the area over the years. In the early uh, 1870s, uh, there was a floating bridge. I think this is kind of cool. There was a floating bridge that was built across uh, the water south of the dam. And it was said to be 12 feet wide. And it was held together by a, a huge chain or a series of huge chains. And it was a shortcut from the downtown area over to Cotter Street. Basically, uh, it was dual purpose. Uh, it allowed people to cross the, uh, the pond. Uh, and it also allowed people to, to take their cattle uh, across the pond. It was kind of a shortcut across the pond uh, to the areas uh, that were still, uh, that weren't built up uh, so that you could, uh, there was a number of meadows and you could take your cattle over or I guess your sheep or your pigs or whatever you happen to want to take. Uh, you could take them across on this bridge and uh, allow them to graze. and then, Take them home at night, I guess. As I said, uh, the uh, the bridge, the first bridge that they, they built really only lasted till the 1880s when it was dilapidated. Uh, of course, it was built of wood, so you know what do you expect? And uh, and it washed away. And uh, dams washing away it was quite a common. Occurrence. If you take a look at the New Market era, or you know, I do a lot of, of oral history uh, interviews, and uh, that's a reoccurring theme. People talking to or talking to me uh, about uh, how the dam gave way, you know, what the consequences were of the dam uh, giving way, uh, you know, all of the damage that was done. So it, it appears to have been a a, a real occurring uh, event in New Market's history. In the early days, the unpolluted water provided, as I say, a place for both swimming and fishing. Uh, you, know, you go down there and fish. In the winter, uh, skating and hockey took place over the area. And there was racing uh, with horse and cutter. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, they had, uh, obviously, uh, uh, a lot colder winters back then. Uh, those of you who are a little bit older, like me, uh, tell the stories about how uh, cold our winters were back then. Not only were they cold, but they lasted a heck of a lot longer uh, in my memory. Um, and uh, and people used to go out onto the ice with their ho horses and a cutter, which is basically a wagon with uh, skates on it, for lack of a better word, 
uh, and they would have races and people would, would go out for a, a spin uh, on, the, uh, on the lake. For many years, the high school students from the west part of town used the pond as a shortcut in the winter to cross over to Cotter Street and up Piggy's Lane uh, to the high school. Uh, you know, and many, many uh, uh, times when I was doing interviews, people talked about the fact that, that during the winter time you could walk across the, the, the lake, which was a shortcut rather than having to go all the way around. You could cut right across uh, to Piggy's Lane and then up Piggy's Lane uh, to the high school. Uh, winter was also the time when 16 inch square blocks of ice were cut from the frozen pond and they were stored in an ice house on Court Street. Uh, and uh, there uh, people were able to take their, their meats and, uh, and store them there uh, in the, the ice house uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the summertime. So I think that's pretty cool. 16 inches uh, uh, square blocks of ice. Uh, that means that it wasn't tremendously cold uh, at that period of time. And as I said, there must have been a considerable volume of water there to, to get 16 inches uh, blocks of, of ice. And during the summer, uh, three blocks of ice were delivered around town for, for people's ice boxes. And I referred to this before when I was talking about my grandmother. My grandmother said that, uh, uh, that it was a standard procedure for a man with a horse and carriage to come along and, and bring uh, huge blocks of ice uh, to each house. Uh, for their uh, for the storage uh, of their, their food. The parcel of land which makes up the Memorial Park and includes Ferry Lake uh, is actually uh, lots 92 and 93 uh, concession 1E if you ever are taking a look at the Young Street survey uh, and again uh, Quite often in, in the presentations that I do, I, I show a slide of that survey and you can see uh, the, uh, the actual pond and area uh, on the survey. And you can, it's interesting to take a look in the two different surveys. In one survey, there's the river flowing through. And uh, you know, a few years later, you see the survey with the pond on and it's obvious that they've dammed uh, the river and, cre and create a man-made pond. The area is 31 acres. I know it's, for those people who walk, probably don't realize that you're walking uh, through an area that is uh, 31 acres, extending from Water Street uh, north to the Mulock side road. A parcel of land was initially patented uh, to a gentleman named Simon uh, McMurty uh, by the Crown, and it was sold to, to Joseph Hill in 1801. So that means that Joseph Hill in 1801 was not the original owner. He didn't petition the, the, the crown for that land. He actually bought it from a gentleman who, you know, I guess a very smart man who actually owned the land uh, previous to, to Joseph Hill. The land was then sold to a gentleman named uh, Beeman uh, in 1804. And since then uh, it had uh, numerous owners. It's important to understand that uh, up till the uh, period when the conservation area uh, took control, uh, the area was privately owned, which is kind of interesting. The land adjacent to the pond on the west side where the waterworks were located and where uh, the restaurant is now was privately owned until 1887. Uh, and the town purchased that land uh, because it was, of course, being used for the waterworks, being used for hydro, so the town purchased that land, so that was, uh, that was town land. The land on the east side was purchased by the office specialty in 1906, and of course most people will remember the office specialty. What's interesting is that the, uh, the same people, as I say, who own Ferry Lake also owned the land uh, past Timothy Street. So uh, in 1906, when the office specialty arrived, uh, they had to, to purchase uh, the land where the office specialty was going to be built uh, to build uh, the buildings and to create the, uh, the industry there. In 1959, the land was purchased by the town and the thought of establishing a conservation area uh, was bantered around by council. Uh, if you take a look at the 
council uh, records from that period, you'll see that uh, you know they talked about the idea of creating a centralized uh, conservation uh, area in, in Newmarket uh, and cleaning it up because it, of course, because it had been an industrial uh, pond, uh, they thought it was a good idea to to uh, to clean it all up. In 1960, uh, the Upper Poland Valley Conservation Authority uh, changed its name and it took over. Uh, subsequently, in 62, uh, it took over the uh, the uh, the ownership and the maintenance of uh, Ferry Lake, and uh, the pond was dredged. Uh, I just barely remember from 62 them uh, dredging it. The embankments were reinforced, and appro approximately 18 acres uh, were graded, uh, shaped, seeded, sodded, and landscaped. And they put in uh, 7,000 trees. Hard to believe, but uh, they actually put in 7,000 trees. I would assume a large number of those have been cut down over the years, but uh, you know, at first there were 7,000 trees in there. This took about five months and it cost about $80,000 to do. And again, we're talking about 1962. In 1963, the area was officially opened and dedicated by our then mayor, uh, Mayor Kent. In 63, uh, Mr. Uh, Wesley Brooks uh, died and the conservation uh, uh, people decided that they would uh, rename the area the Wesley Brooks uh, Memorial uh, Park, uh, which they did in 1965. The town donated the park uh, to the to the uh, conservation uh, people, and they uh, decided that what they would do is they would uh, enlarge the area. Uh, to be a larger recreation area and also to become a waterfall uh, sanctuary. This is the reason why we've got all those ducks and, and geese down there. In 1970, the Conservation Authority's uh, jurisdiction again expanded and uh, it was renamed the South Lake uh, Simcoe uh, Conservation uh, Authority. And at this point, uh, they were put in charge of not only Ferry Lake, but also uh, all of the area where the the, the river had formerly uh, flowed. So uh, that essentially is uh, all the way from Aurora, all the way up to uh, uh, to Hall Landing uh, became their jurisdiction. Uh, obviously, when they uh, anybody wants to build in that area. Uh, they need to to consult the authority. And you can, the authority will decide whether uh, it's a good idea to have buildings uh, in that area. Uh, for those people who go for a walk, you'll notice that. <coughs> excuse me. Other than the the, the walkways, you know the the uh, the Taylor uh, walkway along there, uh, there is there are very few buildings that come down to the to the river or where the river was. Uh, the reason for that is that it still is designated as a water plain or a water uh, hazard area. Uh, should there ever be uh, excessive rains or there should there ever be a flood, uh, that area would be underwater. And so, um, you know, uh, they, they don't allow building uh, right down into the close to the water. In uh, 1973, they built a pavilion complex. Uh, and if you walk through that area, you probably are, are used to seeing that. Uh, this is an area where, you know, over the years, uh, you know, uh, bands and, uh, and local entertainment has performed. It's, been, it's pretty cool. And as I say, one, uh, one shelter is covered by a fire pit. So, you know, you can go down there and you can have a picnic and have a barbecue, uh, which again is, is kind of good. Uh, in September of 1981, the pond was drained again uh, in cooperation with the uh, York Durham Sanitary Sewer uh, Project, where they put in new new pipes uh, to uh, to service the, the expanding uh, uh, suburban area around Newmarket. And uh, at the same time, they decided that they would uh, dredge the uh, the pond and clean it out yet again. And uh, it was fairly slow to begin, and uh, it took quite a while to do, but eventually the project was completed. 
and uh, during this period of time, uh, they redid the, the park all the way from Water Street down to New Lock Drive. We put in new walkways and a bridge uh, joining the east and western parts of the conservation uh, area. Uh, and again, if you if you walk through there, and I think most people at some point have walked through the, the park, so I don't need to go into too much detail. The banks were stabilized, a new control valve was placed in the dam, and the west side of the dam was landscaped, and they put up floodlights. It's actually quite a pretty area uh, in, in the evening, uh, as I think most people know. Uh, the York Durham big pipe was laid from the northeast side of Mulock at a total cost of approximately $800,000. And again, uh, as you probably know, uh, they're going to be digging this up yet again. Uh, they're going to be putting in another uh, new uh, pipe, uh, which will follow the, uh, you know, the former route of the of the river uh, down all the way to the uh, northern. Uh, boundaries of Newmarket. So uh, that's supposed to start, I believe, this year. Uh, so we'll have to see how that works out. I imagine that, that will uh, you know, cause a little bit of havoc in that area. Um, so we'll have to watch and see. So once again, uh, uh, sort of the wrap to this part, once again, the, uh, the park is taken on uh, the role of being the center of enter entertainment here in Newmarket again. Uh, you know, it seems to me that almost anything that's going on of uh, town value that's going to draw people from all over town is held <clears throat> in the area of Ferry Lake, uh, which includes, of course, uh, the River Commons. And uh, so, you know, it's, I guess, come full circle. Um, in that, uh, in that sense. The other thing that I think is uh, uh, at this point we should probably talk about is uh, something that a lot of people don't think about and I mentioned a little earlier. Uh, the river was of, of sufficient size that there was no way to go uh, from the uh, east side of the river to the west side of the river. Now we talked about the putting in a, a sort of suspension bridge uh, which crossed across the pond. Uh, which was one way. Um, and again, uh, very early in our history, uh, they put in uh, Water Street. But again, Water Street kept being uh, washed out. Maybe that's the reason why they called it Water Street, because uh, it kept being uh, washed out and they had to keep uh, redoing it. But the important thing to remember is that uh, in the early days, uh, there was no Timothy Street Bridge, there was no Queen Street Bridge. There was no uh, Davis Drive Bridge. So if you were on the, the uh, west side of, of the river, uh, your only way to get over to the east side was either that uh, 12 foot wide bridge uh, over the pond or the uh, uh, water street. And so you can understand why a flood washing out uh, uh, the bridge and the, the, the road on Water Street was such a big deal uh, to the people here in Newmarket because you were basically isolated from the other side of the river uh, when that happened. Okay, so let's take a look at some pictures uh, to sort of wrap this up. This is Fairy Lake over the years. Now, this is, uh, just to show you this, this is a sample land title uh, for uh, the land that abutted the Fairy Lake. Uh, this is uh, from the uh, from the New Market Ar Archives. So shout out to the New Market Archives uh, uh, for this. And so this is a uh, pretty fancy looking uh, piece of paper, but this uh, gave uh, ownership to uh, a chunk of land that abutted the uh, the mill pond. I talked about the uh, the postcards. This is an example of a postcard uh, of uh, Ferry Lake obviously taken from the, uh, the area uh, up by the, the old Newmarket High School. Uh, many people will probably remember this view. I like it because it's, you know, it's a very, uh, uh, well, not only is it color, but it's also a very nice color. It's not a screaming color. Uh, and uh, this really takes me back because uh, I can remember as a, as a child, even long before I went to high school, riding 
up the hill on Prospect Street and looking down on the on the town from uh, and across Ferry Lake. And this is basically what I saw. As you can see uh, here, you have the waterworks here. Uh, you have the Christian Baptist Church steeple here. You can see the old town hall. So this is uh, pretty interesting. I think pretty interesting uh, uh, postcard. This is a postcard that I wish I owned, but uh, I don't, alas. Uh, I don't collect postcards, but if I did, this is certainly one of the ones I would want in my collection. This is the office specialty from Ferry Lake. So as you can see, uh, the office specialty was built where it was built uh, because of the fact that there was still considerable water passing uh, along uh, the river on the other side of the dam. Uh, for those of you who worked at the specialty, you will remember that there was, I guess what they call an influte. Uh, so in other words, there was a man-made uh, uh, canal that was built from the river uh, that went into the office specialty in order uh, to allow them to use the water to generate electricity and to run their machinery. And then the water came out of the specialty and continued along the uh, river. Of course, that uh, that particular flute is, is gone now, but uh, that's one of the reasons why the office specialty decided to locate there because of the availability of water power. This is Cotter Island. Uh, you remember I mentioned uh, he built a house uh, that uh, where the property came right down to the pond, and then he built this little uh, uh, man-made island in uh, Ferry Lake. Uh, this picture, unfortunately, doesn't have the gazebo in it, but this is what it looked like. You, you would pass over a little uh, uh, bridge onto a man-made uh, uh, island which I think is pretty cool. Of course, that's uh, not there anymore, but the little inlet uh, where this is located uh, is still there. So next time you're out for a walk, you can look for that. Uh, in articles that I've written for Newmark today, I, I refer quite uh, frequently to the, the cannons that we had down at Ferry Lake. Um, the, the town uh, asked for and received uh, uh, cannons to to uh, to put here in Newmarket is sort of a, a remembrance of uh, of Newmarket's uh, and Canada's military uh, success and uh, one of the locations of uh, the, uh, the cannon or of a cannon was uh, beside Ferry Lake by the dam. Uh, this picture was taken uh, previous to the uh, to the Second World War. Uh, there also uh, was a second cannon which was sat outside the post office on Main Street. Uh, both of those cannons were unfortunately uh, donated to the world to the war effort, uh, Second World War effort, and were melted down. So both of the cannons that uh, that uh, we had here in Newmarket are, were long gone, I guess, by the time I was born. But uh, there were in fact cannons here in. And Newmarket, and as I say, they sat uh, in front of the waterworks building and beside Ferry Lake by the uh, uh, by the dam. And as you take a look here uh, from this picture, uh, it's interesting. This is the dam that existed now. It's not uh, too hard to uh, figure out why in 1954 uh, the water was able to uh, skirt around the dam or wash the dam out. Uh, it doesn't look very impressive for the amount of water that it. Uh, it had to handle. Again, uh, you know, uh, when I was talking to you and going through the history of the of uh, the mill pond, uh, I talked about uh, ice blocks, and here is an actual picture of them uh, cutting ice uh, from Ferry Lake. Uh, you can see that they got one sled with uh, full, and they're busy cutting uh, more. I think this is. Pretty cool. I've always thought this is a great picture. Here's another picture, uh, obviously taken by uh, a local person. Uh, this is uh, Ferry Lake. I know it's not a very clear picture, uh, but it is a picture that was taken and subsequently turned into a uh, to a postcard uh, by uh, uh, the local press here. Uh, but uh, it's kind of interesting, as you can see. Uh, 
fairy lake was was quite impressive, uh, and you can see a thick forest coming right down to the to the uh, to the sides of the of the pond. Uh, of course, that's all been manicured. Those uh, those trees uh, uh, are gone, and you can imagine when they first drained the pond, uh, you know, all of the the stumps that they would have to take out because essentially. Uh, what they did was they just simply flooded the, the, the area and any trees that were there uh, would have been, you know, left, uh, just left in there. Uh, eventually, as they say, they, they, they drained it and they took out all the old stumps. Uh, this is the, uh, the dam, uh, you know, wintertime, as you can see, uh, wooden dam, uh, solidly frozen. You can see up here in the corner. Uh, the uh, corner of the woodworks or the uh, waterworks uh, building, I should say. Uh, so not a very impressive structure. So again, uh, for those people uh, who remember uh, 1954, October of 1954 and Hurricane Hazel, you can understand why this was completely washed away uh, during the hurricane. Again, uh, I put lots of pictures of the dam in here so you can see this is of course, the, the replacement dam that was put in, you can see that now we have concrete and we have metal uh, that was put in. But again, uh, this uh, uh, particular dam was pre-Hurricane uh, Hazel. Uh, and when Hurricane Hazel came, all of this was, was destroyed. So you can tell the force that, uh, that Hurricane Hazel brought uh, with it, uh, the fact that, uh, that this whole area was, was uh, swamped out. A little more modern picture of the, the dam. This is before the current dam, but uh, this is after they put in a, a dam uh, uh, that was a little more, uh, I guess you'd say it worked. Uh, for lack of a better phrase, it worked. You'll notice uh, the concrete uh, embankments. So this was to control the flow of water uh, before uh, this happened. As I say, this was all uh, earthen. And of course, what happened was during Hurricane Hazel, the water came down here and washed away, just washed away this whole area of the, uh, of the embankment. And again, uh, in a few minutes, you'll see pictures of, uh, of what it looked like uh, when the flood uh, came. And this is 1930s. Uh, and again, Fairy Lake looks very peaceful. Uh, as you can see, there's a few houses uh, here and railway tracks coming along here. And of course, they have removed the trees on this side of the, of the pond. Here is a, uh, another winter picture. This gives you an idea of what the dam looked like. Again, wooden. Uh, as you can see, there's your, your walkway over. So there was no uh, uh, way that you'd get over there uh, by by car. This is just a walkway uh, for uh, for people to, to go across and it went right over the dam. And of course, once this was washed out, this was gone as well and it was back to the drawing board. Another picture uh, taken from up near the, uh, the high school. And another one, I've got a few of these because I, I think this is this is kind of interesting. I, I know they're not great uh, pictures as far as clarity, but it gives you an idea of what the area looked like uh, back at that, uh, that time. Again, this is a little better picture. And as you can see, uh, relatively no buildings around here. No buildings, of course, uh, on this side of the, of the pond. A few uh, up in this area. As you can see, there was a forest here. Of course, that's all gone. Uh, if I had a picture uh, taken today, uh, all you see is a, a massive uh, uh, spread of houses and buildings. Uh, so this is kind of, I think it's kind of a nice picture. There you see the railway tracks. Railway tracks, of course, uh, passed right beside the, uh, the, uh, the pond. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, I would imagine back when the flooding occurred, this would also close the, the railway access uh, 
uh, as well, because this all would have been underwater. Yeah, another old postcard of, of, of uh, Fairy Lake. Again, you can see the uh, waterworks here on the uh, on the side. Thing to remember, you know, as I started mentioning when I started this presentation, uh, for the locals this was called the Mill Pond, uh, but you'll notice it's called Fairy Lake on the uh, postcards. So uh, they were selling an idea, I think, more than anything. Here, this is kind of interesting. Uh, this is a, uh, I guess what they call a, an ice schooner. Uh, basically, it looks like a, a piece of wood on skates and uh, uh, masts where I guess the wind would, would catch you and you could sail along the ice. This is back when, first of all, Fairy Lake froze and when it did freeze, it, it must have uh, frozen uh, fairly solidly because look at, uh, this would be a fairly heavy uh, item to have on the ice. And, this person doesn't seem to be at all worried about going through. Again, uh, another picture of Fairy Lake. As I say, this is a, a picture of uh, the 1957 uh, celebration we had here for our Centennial. And at that time, they decided that what they would do is they would reenact the uh, races that took uh, uh, place here in Newmarket on, on uh, Ferry Lake. And uh, here are two people, one person dressed up in period costume, uh, having a kind of water joust uh, between uh, two guys in canoes, uh, which is kind of interesting. Don't know if I'd want to do it, but interesting. This is a sketch of uh, uh, Ferry Lake. And uh, it's interesting, this is from a, uh, a book, local book, uh, and uh, they called it the swimming, uh, swimming uh, fairy lake. So at that time, people would come here down to the mill pond and they would swim. Water must have been fresh enough and clean enough that they could uh, uh, swim. Obviously, with uh, Aurora being on uh, the, uh, uh, the river system as well, uh, between Aurora and Newmarket, uh, you know, we did a, a great deal of damage to the wire quality uh, over the years. And, uh, you know, the whole idea of swimming uh, on the uh, on the pond uh, is uh, just a distant memory, I think. Same as skating. I don't think water freezes when it's polluted. This is the uh, uh, picture of the mill that existed uh, on the, uh, beside uh, the mill pond. You can see that at this point uh, they, are, they have a steam uh, generating electricity with steam. It's a fairly interesting picture, I think. Some of these buildings are still here. Here's a, uh, another picture. This is this part. So this building here and this building here. Uh, that still remain, uh, although in, in just horrible repair. I don't know how long they'll, much longer they'll be there. And that's where I, I mentioned you can get a glimpse of the, uh, or you could. I, I haven't been down there uh, this year, obviously, but uh, you could get a glimpse of the of the old generation uh, electricity generation uh, uh, machinery. As I mentioned earlier, in front of the, the old waterworks uh, building was a uh, uh, monument to, to Haynes. This was uh, moved, of course, uh, down across the road from the uh, uh, Anglican Church on uh, Darcy, corner Darcy and, uh, and Church Street. Well, but it stood there, you know, from 19, uh, 1901 until it was moved. Is a little better picture of it. I kind of like this uh, this uh, picture because I kind of like this house. Uh, very functional. You, you can see that this is the house where the gentleman who ran the waterworks lived. And uh, at the back was the factory or the generation uh, area where they generated the, the electricity. Nice manicured lawn and uh, living next door to the, the uh, the pond would probably have been nice in the summertime, uh, unless, of course, there was a flood or uh, 
uh, in the winter time it may have been a, a little bit uh, dangerous, but uh, I think it looks like a nice house. I would like to have lived there. Now we'll get into some of the flooding. This is uh, a picture taken from uh, uh, the flooding that, that took place in 54, as you can see. And I guess in my words, I wasn't able to describe it too effectively, but this gives you an idea. What had happened was the water, of course, continues to, to flood over the dam, but it's also bypassing the dam. So it's going around the dam. Uh, it's washed away uh, the earth that was supposed to be keeping it uh, and directing it uh, over the dam. So it's washed that away and the water is, is flooding uh, around the dam. I told you that uh, the uh, uh, Water Street Bridge collapsed. This is a picture of the of the uh, the dam collapsing. You can see the people standing there uh, looking at the uh, uh, at the dam. Pieces of this uh, of this uh, bridge uh, flowed down as far as Queen Street. Uh, so, yeah, there was a lot of force of water. You can see how high it is. Also, you can see that trees are being taken along with it. And if you look really closely, you can see how the the uh, land has been eroded away, how the water has just simply taken the land away uh, and the water has just gushed around it. There's another uh, interesting picture that was taken uh, of the flood. Again, you can see how high the water is. And you can see the, the chunks of wood that are floating. Again, uh, the flooding of the uh, the sides of the of the mill pond. Uh, it's pretty pretty devastating. So this is uh, this is taken from the paper uh, of the day, and you can see this is particularly interesting. Uh, I don't know whether it's just the angle they took the picture, but this is this water looks like a real torrent as it uh, uh, flows along. And again, you know, I want to emphasize for those people who are maybe a little bit younger and, uh, you know, laugh when I talk about the Holland River and how it generated electricity and how it ran mills and this sort of thing. Uh, this river was a mighty river. And uh, it, uh, as I say, it extended from the back of uh, the Main Street buildings all the way over to where the office specialty was. So that was the width. Uh, so that was all under water at one time. One of the nice things that, uh, that the Historical Society has done uh, over the years is to put up cairns to commemorate uh, people in Ferry Lake. This one is to Mesa de la Roche. Uh, it's a great place to have the cairn because just behind uh, uh, this cairn is the house where she was born and grew up. Uh, most of you remember uh, probably studying Mesa de la Roche when you were in school. She was a uh, writer of the Jauna and the, uh, and the White, White Oaks uh, series of, of, uh, of books. And uh, she sort of was, was brought back into public uh, interest when the CBC decided to do a series on the Jauna and a series on the White Oaks uh, family. What's really cool is that the uh, Characters uh, and the setting uh, for both of these books are actually set here in Newmarket and area. Uh, and a lot of the characters were people who were in fact, uh, people who lived in uh, Newmarket and people who uh, were uh, well known to, to Mesa de la Roche. Uh, most people know that she was very much into status. And so uh, her name was actually Mesa Roche. She decided that she would add de la to it to make it sound more impressive um, uh, so that she could, uh, I guess, claim that she had some, some royal French blood uh, going through her veins. I also should mention that uh, she was a relative of my grandmother. Uh, she was a Lundy. Uh, so you know, she and the Lundys have been here forever. Uh, my grandmother's uh, family, as I alluded to uh, very early in the presentation, the Lundys came here in 1802 uh, and have been here ever since. And they married 
into every family that was here. I guess there was a limited choice. Uh, so they married into every family uh, that was here. So when people uh, say to me, are you related to my family? I usually answer probably in some way. Uh, beside the cache restaurant, you will see the uh, this Karen. This Karen uh, talks about the founding of New Market. It talks about what we talk about, which is uh, how Joseph Hill built a, uh, a water-powered uh, mill on the side of, uh, of the river and how he dammed the river in order to, uh, to create the, the mill pond. Uh, so when you're out, if you haven't seen this before, you may want to, uh, to stop and, and read it. It's a little bit of our history and I think it's cool that they put it up there. This is from Ferry Lake. Uh, of course, uh, the Tom Taylor Trail is, uh, is located uh, along the river, uh, all the way to the, the northern boundary of, uh, of Newmarket. And uh, it initially starts uh, uh, around Aurora and comes up. It passes through, of course, uh, Ferry Lake, as uh, most of you know. Um, so this is a fitting tribute to John Taylor, who was uh, uh, into conservation long before uh, the rest of us got on board. Uh, he was a leading figure uh, in the conservation of, uh, of the green spaces, uh, Newmarket area. So it's fitting that they named the trail after Tom Taylor. So kudos to him. And uh, when you're walking through the park, you can see this uh, uh, there uh, in tribute to uh, Tom Taylor and the trail that they named after him. And uh, to close off the presentation, I'll show you a few modern pictures that I took. Uh, photography is not my strength, uh, so you know these pictures are perhaps not as good as they as they could be. Uh, obviously, anybody who goes down to Fairy Lake uh, is met with geese and and ducks. Uh, this is because it is obviously a wildlife sanctuary. Uh, so, you know, they remind you you're not supposed to feed them, but of course nobody pays any attention to that. And they come, come back year after year. And as I mentioned, uh, the walkways are paved. It's during the, uh, the, well, actually most times of the year, it's an incredible walk, great way to get to exercise. It's a beautiful area town and the conservation area. Uh, people have done a remarkable job in maintaining this. Uh, during the winter time, uh, you might find that the, the sidewalks have snow, but uh, most of the year it's, it's an incredible place to, to go out for a walk and uh, walk through uh, a little bit of new market history. And just imagine, as you're walking along here, imagine uh, that uh, this, was, uh, this area was, was created by man and uh, was at one time had a raging river flowing uh, through it that was harnessed by, uh, harnessed by our early uh, settlers. Here it is in the winter time and again you can see uh, even the snow doesn't stop people from walking through the area. It's a four seasons area. No longer can you uh, go out on the uh, obviously on the pond and skate or Certainly couldn't take a horse out there. Horse and buggy uh, wouldn't last very long, but uh, still the area uh, alongside of it is beautiful. It, uh, the trees are, are maturing nicely, so it's still very beautiful. And again, uh, there are numerous little uh, uh, bridges that have been uh, put in there to make the whole area very quaint. This is uh, Fairy Lake from Water Street. I mentioned this before, uh, you know, they put in a, a nice new fountain in the middle of uh, uh, Ferry Lake, uh, which is lit in the evening. Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, obviously, the town does an excellent job of, of decorating the bridge with, uh, with uh, flowers. So it really is a beautiful area. Uh, I think uh, we in Newmarket should be very proud of, uh, of the job that we all have done in, uh, in creating a sanctuary. Uh, in this area. So that, uh, I guess, is, comes to the end of uh, my 
story about uh, Fairy Lake. I hope that uh, you've enjoyed uh, my trip uh, through a little bit of history. Uh, you've got a better idea of Fairy Lake next time you're down downtown area. Uh, if you haven't been checking out Fairy Lake, that you'll go. And if you have been walking through Fairy Lake, you'll have a, a little better sense of the history of, uh, of the area and, and why Fairy Lake has been probably one of the most uh, important aspects in our history and our growth uh, over the years. As is usually the case uh, in what I do, there are so many people that uh, uh, you need to thank. These are the references for this particular presentation, The History of the Town of Newmarket by Ethel Truella. Uh, she wrote the, the, the Green Book. It is the definitive history of Newmarket, in, uh, in my opinion. Uh, she does all of, uh, of New Market history, and uh, what's amazing is that she interviewed people uh, who were uh, and did oral histories, uh, you know, interviewed them with oral history, and then uh, wrote what they had to say in her book. So most of the information in her book uh, came firsthand uh, from people who lived through the events, lived through the the, the creation and the building of New Market. So it's pretty exciting. Files from the New Market era, uh, which of course I was able to access at uh, the New Market Library. New Market Library is such an important resource for me. Uh, people there are so helpful when I'm looking for things. And uh, there are uh, whole, whole weeks when I, I, I practically live at the library while I'm doing my research. Uh, council minutes, uh, I wish you also can access, of course, at the, at the library. Uh, the Holland Valley Conservation Authority report from 1953, uh, which I have a copy of uh, that was given to my uncle George Lusby. Uh, and also I have a copy of the Wesley Brooks Memorial Conservation Area Master Plan, which was published in, in 1979. And probably most important for me uh, are the uh, various oral history interviews that I do. Uh, in the beginning, I used to, to record the audio. Uh, now I've moved to, to video. Uh, during the period now when, uh, when we can't meet face to face, I've been doing uh, a lot of my, uh, my interviews over uh, Zoom and Skype and recording those. So I, I'm continuing to do them. It's so vital that, uh, that uh, we save these stories for the next generation so that uh, you know, our uh, our children and our children's children are not looking through books and, and having no clue uh, how we got to where we are now and the amazing stories of the people who built uh, this community. And the people that I always thank every time I do anything, whether it be the walks, whether it be uh, the articles, no matter what I do, uh, I always thank these people because they are the pillars of history here in Newmarket. Uh, my uncle, George Lusby, uh, most of the, the sketches uh, that you will see of old Newmarket uh, were done by him. Uh, he started in, in the early 1930s as a youth uh, capturing them, and he continued to do that until he passed uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, he also wrote books. Uh, he held uh, so many different uh, uh, positions uh, with the, the Heritage uh, Association and also the Historical Association. So, you know, and he was the inspiration for me uh, when I was uh, a kid. He got me interested in, uh, in history, in our local history. Uh, for him, history came alive in the retelling of history. And uh, over the years, I was able to help him out. As, as time went by, I was able to help more and more uh, up to the uh, point where I was able to do uh, a lot of the research. He taught me how to research, so you know I have to thank him for that. Uh, the Toronto Archives, you know, I always have to thank them. Uh, the fact that we have the, the archives available uh, to the public to go uh, check out is, is such a gift for us. The Newmarket Archives, it's currently closed, but hopefully uh, it will reopen and uh, be able to, to, to make use of that. And hopefully those people who have 
items that uh, they would like to save. Uh, we'll think seriously about donating them to the archives once the archives uh, reopens. Rod Pilfrey and Norm Friend, uh, those are two gentlemen who uh, worked at the archives for years and years. Very friendly, very helpful. Anytime I needed help, uh, so I, you know, shout out goes to them. And finally, Terry Carter. Uh, somebody asked me one day whether uh, I, who I would say was the the official historian of Newmarket, and uh, I told them the same thing as I told everybody. For as long as I can remember, uh, that would be Terry Carter. Terry Carter, um, I believe, single-handedly saved our history from it being forgotten. Uh, he was the editor of the New Market Era, and at that time, uh, the New Market Era would publish articles on our history. Uh, he would go back into the archives of the of the era and republish uh, uh, articles from back uh, when the uh, the era was founded. Uh, he was a huge advocate for, for our history. As you probably know, he, he wrote numerous books on New Market history. He has a writing style that uh, no one can match. Uh, sort of a, uh, a writing style where he's having a conversation with you uh, about these things. You could tell his enthusiasm for, for our history. So kudos to Terry Carter. Um, you will always be the, the king of, uh, of uh, New Market history. Uh, I hope he's doing well. Uh, and all our thoughts are with him. And with that, uh, you know, I wish you uh, good health. Uh, stay safe. And hopefully one day we will all be out there walking uh, through our town of New Market and enjoying the history. And I hope this series of uh, presentations that I'm doing uh, will help you to better recognize uh, the history around you. So until we meet again, take care.